we set up a separate company hosting villa retreats here in Ibiza, which was a goal I set years ago. And then we and then we, we sold every single retreat out. And last year we scheduled 24 back-to-back retreats. We hired a villa for a ridiculous amount of money, six figures um, for a year, 10 million pound villa with 10 bedrooms. And we put down deposits. We also had a membership site that we'd been running for about a year before that. And then COVID hit. You're listening to the Label Machine series, a podcast to inspire and help indie record labels and artists to build income streams for their music. I'm Nick Sadler, a music entrepreneur that has helped start and run multiple indie record labels. In this series, I'll be speaking with music industry leaders about their experience and the lessons they learn on how they both market and grow their music income. Welcome to the Label Machine series, where we discuss with our guests how artists and record labels make money. Today's guest is Danny Savage. Danny has had over 15 years working on the forefront of the music industry and has been instrumental in helping DJs, artists, and brands connect with an international audience. He's a hugely inspirational entrepreneur, creative marketing expert, and the mastermind behind DJ Growth Labs, the DJ Growth Conferences, and more recently, the Mix Masters platform, which helps artists build a successful career in electronic music. Danny, it is an absolute honor to have you on the show today. How are you? Thank you. I'm good, Nick. How are you? I'm very good. And where are you calling in from? Um, from home in Ibiza. Home in Ibiza. And how's lockdown going out there? Um, we don't have a lockdown. Well, so, there we go. <laughs> so it's going we're, great. <laughs> it's going great, yeah. Um, restaurants and bars are closed. That's the, the main restriction. Yep. we were allowed to go out and uh well we're allowed to go out <laughs> yeah. and do everything we can go uh, this morning i've been in the bank and opened a new bank account i've been to the post office dropped the kids off and uh come on and for this so, normal yeah, it's, normal life then sort of as, <laughs> as good as it... all right so going to start at where we start with everybody how did you get started in the music industry so talk about the story up to where you are now probably just before you start uh the mix masters platform how long you got <laughs> um okay so i think i i right when i all right so when i was, when I was eight or nine um okay. <laughs> I got into rave music. Um one of my cousins was a DJ on the r- local pirate radio station and um I ended up I, I think the first ever rave tape I bought was now uh, the ultimate rave. Then I bought Now Dance 91. So I must have been about 10. And then I started selling rave tapes at school. Um so I sold rave tapes and I did a milk round and that enabled me to save up and buy my first decks but I, I only bought one deck i had one sound lab belt drive turntable and a tandy you remember tandy mixer yep. Yep. so i had a tandy mixer and a belt drive turntable and i never i didn't get another deck and <laughs> that's all i could afford so i bought these um and i bought some vinyl i bought my first vinyl so i was basically mixing a cassette tape into a vinyl so where I where where I come from in West Yorkshire, uh, there was a big illegal rave scene, and my my cousin was like, um, I thought it was cool, so I wanted to be a DJ on that radio station. I wanted to be a pirate radio DJ, but I never did. But um, when I was a kid, that's what I wanted to do. Um, but yeah, I always wanted to become a DJ. So um, and and it. When I got to about 17, 18, I, start, I got into the sending mixtapes off to clubs. I've actually got all the faxes from all the big labels. My ex-girlfriend sent them to me about three years ago. I hadn't spoken to her for maybe 20 years, but I've got all, she had all these things from um, the faxes that I used to get from record labels, uh, sorry, DJ agents and clubs and stuff. I had like lists of all the people to send promo tapes to. So I used to send tapes off uh, in jiffy envelopes like most people did back then um and i never really got much of a break i got a few gigs here and there 
Um, I got someone ringing my girlfriend's mum's winding me up once, and I thought I got a gig. Um, I played a few um, decent names. Um, I played uh, Insomniacs in Sheffield, a hard dance event. I've played everything, by the way. I played trance, hard house, baseline, house, techno, really hard techno, gabba. I've been into all of it at some point in my life. Um, through, you know, it's like when you go start clubbing. Um, you go through all the different, uh, you go through all the different styles. Yeah. So we go to, like, for example, we go to Gatecrasher one weekend, which were full of um, fluffy boots and fluoro. And then we'd leave there and go to Niche in Sheffield, which were like an underground garage club with, with gangs and shootings and stuff. So <laughs> we, we were pretty diverse uh, with the sort of parties we went to, but we had such a good selection, I suppose, in the North. Um, we had Sheffield, Birmingham, one too far. Leeds was amazing. Um, so we had a really good diverse mix of different uh, big nights, small nights. Uh, the clubs were amazing. I, I was a regular at the Orbit in Morley, which was probably the, one of the best techno clubs in the world ever. I've yet to find a club in the world that uh, can match that atmosphere. Um, so what made you? Then what made you kind of switch then on to the the more the business side um, of the music industry? Yeah. So DJ wise, I never really kicked my career off. Uh, like I said, I got a few gigs and then. I sort of like hung my headphones up. I lost motivation for it. And I thought, look, it's not going to happen for me. Um, and I just resigned to just going out partying and clubbing every weekend. And I had loads of crap jobs. Never really could hold a job down. Um, and I got into, I started, I, I started, I started going to football games, right? This is, if, I, if you really want to know the story. So I started going to football games and I was a Leeds United fan and I got involved with this sort of football casual scene. Mm -hmm. um, hooligans, people might want to call them. Oh, and okay. I started going, for, I, I went for years to these football games and I, I started buying this, uh, I started buying and selling the CCTV footage from these football games. So, and I built a website and it was the website was worldwide and I, I bought and traded and sold all this football casual sort of um, DVDs, uh, documentaries and all that sort of stuff. So in, in the meantime of stopping DJing, I learned how to build an online business and I, I, I was quite successful at one point I was doing like five grand a week. And what I learned doing that was, I was, in, I was involved in all these online communities because um, every football team had the casual uh, forum. Mm -hmm. Back then, it, there were forums, Angel Fire and CG, CJB.net were the main ones. So from scratch, I learned how to use these platforms. I learned how to video edit, and I learned how to do graphics. And, um, and I, looking back as well, I, I used to outsource my design to Romania, and this was like 20, 20 years ago, nearly, um, about 15 15, 16 years ago. And so I was outsourcing then before uh, everyone else was outsourcing Upwork and stuff that became popular. Mm -hmm. uh, and also I was utilizing the forums to build a network. And I was also paying the forum owners to put banner adverts in the forums. So I literally had the whole of the football casual world boxed off or is everywhere, like omnipresent, I like to say nowadays. Mm -hmm. But, and it, it was the number one football casual site in the world, number one Google, everything. Um, and then, so that was, that was sort of like a, I, I was still going clubbing, but I'd sort of like lost my passion for the music myself, like playing music. Mm -hmm. But then through some friends I was hanging around with at the time was, we we're actually having, I remember the time we were having a party back at my house after a club. And I was at the top of my steps, as you do, you just sat hanging around in random places on the floor in your house. Mm -hmm. And there were about four of us sat at the top of my steps, all just chatting. Uh, this was like Sunday, we've been out all night. And um, this girl, Serena, was saying to me, she said, um, it's my 18th birthday, or it might have been the 21st, 18th or 21st. And um, she said, I've got this 18, uh, this birthday party at my local club and the DJ's pulled out. He's, I'm like, why, why is he pulled out? And he called Ali Scott, the guy. And um, he pulled out the DJ gig. And... The reason was he'd never played in front of a crowd before. So he sort of like, he bottled it, if you know what I mean. And mm -hmm. um, so she asked if I wanted to play. So I'd just been to Ibiza about 
a month before and I'd bought some vinyl. I'd sort of like the new electro sound was just starting mm-hmm. and um, like mid 2000s it like that, 2004, five. And I thought I'll re- I got back into the music again. So I bought some vinyl um, and I started playing it again at home, just messing about. And I've still got all my old vinyl. I've got hundreds and hundreds of vinyls in storage. And she asked me to play this party. So I said, oh, I've got all this new vinyl. Yeah, let's do it. And um, so I played this party in Otley. It's a little town in Leeds. And uh, it was a working man's club back room. So like proper yep. Yorkshire working man's club style. But the, so the family were there, um, even grandmas and granddads and stuff. And I'm playing like old school baseline garage, trance, all sorts of mixture. But then all the parents and stuff went off and all the, all the, and there were quite a lot of people there. They're all like young people and it, it went off and it went on till about one in the morning and I was meant to come off and I, I was getting ready to finish, but everyone had a whip round and they, they begged me to stay on and there were all sorts of stuff in there. There were money and, um, <laughs> other things. things. <laughs> so I, I managed to stay on for another two hours. They, they had a lock in at the working man's club and it were like, a, it were like a rave. It were brilliant. And, um, it sort of like give me the buzz back and, um, playing to a crowd. And I've always wanted to play to a crowd. That's all I really wanted. So I, um, the girl whose birthday it was worked at a wine bar and she asked the owner of the wine bar, if we, we both said, let's do a party together. Cause that town, there were like a hundred people there and everyone were just off it dancing properly. Really, really good crowd and I thought there's no nightclubs in this town so we need to put a party on so she approached a, a, a boss at the wine bar or Cork's wine bar at the time and we managed to we, we've got a book in to do a Saturday night and um, this this room we usually reserve for line dancing classes and stuff they never had a rave on and um, so I I was I had to learn how to promote and Obviously, because she was local, she already had a load of people in that town. So we we, we had tickets printed for a fiver, proper tickets with yeah. holographic on and stuff. <laughs> and um, she was selling tickets locally, but I were online promoting as well. So I learned how to use MySpace and um, I were on MySpace. I managed to build a big following on MySpace. I found all these tools that you could use for uh, automation, like posting flyers on all your friends' walls and stuff like that. Uh, friend adding tools so I got really geeky on all that sort of stuff so because I was already in the like online forum world due to the football websites that I used to run um I was I I, I, run, I went into learning online basically I knew the value of online mm-hmm. and um and MySpace were just taking off so I managed to build the decks up on a grand piano because it wasn't set up for um it wasn't set up like for a nightclub. We had to hire everything. We had to bring his own sound system. We had to bring our own deck. We put the decks on the piano and the uh, turntables. And mm-hmm. a couple of my mates DJ'd and it was absolutely amazing um, until a big group of travellers came down and tried storming the doors and all the locals started fighting with them outside. It was just like, yeah, it was, it was chaos. But the night was really good. The vibe was really good until that happened. Um, and then the guy... The guy um, didn't want to do it again, obviously. He says, I'm not having that sort of crowd in my wine bar. Um, so that was, that was the end of the first one. We called it Filth, by the way. So, and then I got in talks of a nightclub in Wakefield, which was a quite a big town. And uh, they wanted me to move the brand there after we've only done one night. So I decided to give it a go. And I booked a guy called Mickey Slim. Um, I, I saw he, he did that jump around remix track and, uh, he's actually coming on my podcast in a couple of weeks and, um, he was like bubbling up and I managed to book him for like 500 pounds, but, but the downside was he were playing at four in the morning. So I saw that he had three other gigs in the North and I just put a cheeky offer in. I said, look, I'll put him on at four o'clock. Um, I know he's in, I think you're in Derby or somewhere or somewhere nearish. <laughs> And I managed to get him for 500 quid. So at the time, it, it was to the Leeds crowd. It was massive. It was, it was sell out, it like Kiss the Funk. He used to book him in Leeds and he'd sell out Kiss the Funk. Um, but I put him on in Wakefield, which was still in the catchment area of Leeds, but it was further enough away that it didn't um, annoy Kiss the Funk and didn't get into any uh, agreements, what they'd had to have him exclusive in Leeds, for example. So I managed to get him on Wakefield. So the whole of Leeds literally descended on Wakefield. And we sold that night out. 
we sold 650. Um, they stopped letting people in on the door. The bar was dry by like one in the morning. There were actually no alcohol left in the club by one in the morning. They'd never, ever seen the club as busy since it had been open in 15 years, something like that. So wow. we got off to quite a good start. Um, and that was all due to building the MySpace following and networking well, choosing residents that also had a good following that would also work for the night. It weren't particularly famous, but they had a good local following. Mm -hmm. um, so the first night we were off to a flying start straight away. My second booking was uh, Will Bailey, who's now called Low Stepper, who's quite big. Um, and I think we had Ben Macklin. Richard Dinsdale and Kate Lawler. So we already had a few big hitters on from the start. And then after six months, I decided that like Wakefield was a bit grim and crappy and I wanted to move it to Leeds. Cause it was like, it, if you've been to Wakefield, it's full of street fights and it's not mm -hmm. a, a town in Yorkshire and um, it's not a city. So like Leeds obviously is the coolest place up North for nightlife. And I approached the mink club. I phoned up, as you do. You just phone the club and ask them if they've got any spare nights. And I spoke to Val, the owner, and she goes, ah, just so happens that as from yesterday, we've got the second Saturday of the month available starting in September. And she goes, you can have that if you want. I'm like, really? It was that easy? I'm like, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> I've got like one of the best, most iconic clubs in the, in the, in the country. And it literally took me two minutes on a phone and I bagged a night, uh, a regular Saturday as well. And um, and then and then we sold that out um, because um, we just I just in the meantime as well I'd gone for my first season in Ibiza working and I was running the night from Ibiza flying back to Wakefield to run the night so I was quite um, I adapted quite well to freelance work mm -hmm. um, freelance work remote work sorry mm -hmm. so and. I was in Ibiza, and while I was in Ibiza, I started working for the Zoo Project, selling tickets on the street, and I soon realized that I can't be asked walking the streets like everyone else, and I started building a list of people coming over on holiday, so I was in contact with people on MySpace and Facebook, and then getting spreadsheets full of people, what dates they were coming, how many were coming, how many tickets I could sell them, and yeah, so... I was doing that whilst flying back to England and uh, running these nights. And then, so by the end of the summer, when we relaunched in Leeds, we'd already built a big worker following up in, in Ibiza. It lived in Leeds as well. A lot of, a lot, there were a lot of northerners in, mm -hmm. in Ibiza, a lot of Manchester, Leeds. So we'd built a good following in Ibiza as well. And then, so that obviously helped us kick off the, uh, the launch in Leeds. And then it just went on from there. And uh, we, we managed to bag successful residences at Sankey's Ministry of Sound in London, Rainbow in Birmingham. So we had like a, we had about three or four parties around the UK every month. Uh, the highlight booking, I managed to book Faithless Live um, because I would not accept no for an answer. Um, and I went on and on and on for nearly six months emailing their agent and just getting nowhere and nowhere. And I would never stop until I booked them and then I managed to get them for a, a live gig in Leeds where we sold out the O2 Arena. So that's probably the highlight of my booking career as a, as a, as a, as a promoter. And, and I've, I've run my own festivals off the back of that. I run my own festival in Leeds called Field Trip Festival. So all of, all of this <laughs> is really showing that you were A, learning how to build, how to use digital tools and how to use online businesses to to be grow an audience and how important it is to grow those audiences and reach out to them um and all the all the time doing it in the music industry and the creative industry which is you know typically one of the harder areas to do it in um then you ended up on dragon's den do you want to just quickly talk about that so <laughs> that was me and my girlfriend we uh, this is, a, this is a long story as well. But anyway, so... Try and do, do a short version. <laughs> do a short version. So, <laughs> we, we, we was living in... I converted an old bus, right? And I decided to run my events company at the time, Igloo Disco, from this bus. And we came back to... Well, what's, Igloo Disco, what's Igloo Disco, for those that don't know? So Igloo Disco is an events company that uh, I bought... Uh, basically, when I was running club nights, I, I don't know why it... Why did I think... All oh, right, so... <laughs> 
<laughs> I bought an ice cream van and I turned it into a DJ booth um, because one day when we were at an after party, my friend remixed an ice cream van noise. And um, I said, we should make a video for it. And then this idea just ended up being really cool. So I bought an ice cream van, paid a graffiti artist to do it all up. We got a sponsor and turned it into a proper mobile DJ booth ice cream van. And I pitched it to all the big festivals. We managed to get in Glastonbury, Creamfields, Global Gathering. And we managed to DJ. I took my brand there. We had this pitch. So anyway, we're doing this ice cream van in all these clubs, uh, in all these festivals for about two years. And it was really fun. But I thought, right, next thing we need to do now is build a marquee to put it in. Um, and I yeah. thought, what, what else goes with ice cream? So an igloo, obviously. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, we need to get an inflatable igloo as like our arena for the, for the festivals. Because if you've ever done a festival stage, basically a music festival will give you X amount of money and you deal with everything. That's mm -hmm. how it works. And you bring all, you sell tickets, you bring a sound system, um, they'll give you a generator, but you've got to deal with everything else. So we had a decor team, we had a sound system, we had decks, we had everything we brought with us. Uh, it was good fun. But I wanted to step it up a level and put it in a marquee. Um, so then I so I started researching, and then um, I went and ordered one in China. Mm -hmm. And then you ordered um, an, an, an inflatable igloo. An inflatable igloo. Yeah, well, the first one were twelve meters diameter, and. I didn't know anything about like health and safety or wind restrictions and all this. How, yeah, it would just, I just, just it. get it, get it done. Just get it done. Worry about that. I later. just went on Alibaba, bought an igloo and uh, had it sent over. I think it were about five grand. And then I did a party in it. And then someone in the party asked if they could hire it. And then I said, yeah, yeah, it's uh, I can't remember how much we charged for the first one, maybe 800 pounds a grand. And then at that part, someone asked if they could hire it. And I thought, actually, there's legs in this business. Um, it's quite cool. We, I know what I'm doing with nightclubs. I know so I can put sound systems in it. I can we bought sort of like a mobile pop-up nightclub. So it was originally bought to house the ice cream van, but then it became its – we never actually really did any parties with the ice cream van. It became its own thing. So um, we started doing parties all over the U.K., 18th birthdays, we did some weddings, uh, we did music festivals, all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, at, w at one point we had eight igloos all around wow. the country, different sizes. We had big ones, small ones, uh, all for different types of event. Um, we did them indoors. Um, it grew to quite a big thing. And um, so, yeah, Dragon's Den. Um, I'd always wanted to go on Dragon's Den. That's a uh, um, bucket list. I set it as a goal. But the truth is, they actually called uh, our office and asked if we wanted to go on Dragon's Den, just out of the blue. So obviously, I think it's a wind-up. I'm like, whatever. And like, yeah, do you want to come on Dragon's Den? I'm like, everyone knows I wanted to go on Dragon's Den. So I thought it was someone taking the piss. But um, it, they've got sort of like a research team that go around looking for interesting people, they say. So obviously, they've, they've read a few blogs about me, a club promoter. Um, some crazy stories and then the next thing I've got inflatable igloos so it just probably seemed to them like uh, it would be a fun show having a guy with igloos from a yep. nightclub background DJ etc so um, I was so we got we got the date to go on Dragon's Den and then um, I decided that because I was absolutely t petrified of speaking or I've never done anything like that I've never been interviewed I've, I've done a couple of magazine interviews uh, i'd been on galaxy radio doing a show and i was absolutely I was terrible and uh i had no like i had no uh, sort of like communication skills when it came to interviewing and mm -hmm. um so i decided to get a public a public speaking coach and it was bilal from the public speaking academy i think the thing they're from sheffield mm -hmm. so i went to one of their group classes and then I got some one-to-one -one coaching, so I got some pitch training. So we, we crafted the pitch for Dragon's Den over the course of like two weeks before it. And it had like touches of NLP in it, um, so like neuro-linguistic programming, if no one knows what that is. It's NLP, it's a type of like persuasion mm -hmm. um, pitching. Yeah, and so if you look at the Dragon's Den pitch, the opening line was the NLP thing. It was to it was to own the room by telling them all to close their eyes. And Peter Jones, uh, he, he had a bee in his bonnet straight away. He didn't want to do it. He didn't like it. You could see on the Dragon's Den thing, he pulled the right face when I asked him to close their eyes. 
So that was a technique used to like control the room, get them to close their eyes and visualize something. So that means you're in charge. So sort of like, mm-hmm. you can, and you Peter know, Jones doesn't want to be taken in charge. He doesn't. Taking charge of dragons is like, uh, <laughs> yeah. so like people probably don't look at, people probably look at that from the outside and don't realize what we're going on, but that was a technique used. Uh, but anyway, but yeah, so I went to Dragon's Den. It managed to get featured on the, um, I've got my 15 minutes of fame, 16 minutes. So I got featured a lot of, I think something like only 10% of people that go on Dragon's Den and they, they film it, that actually get through to being on TV. It's only a small amount. So obviously they saw, but I didn't get investment by the way, but they, saw, they must have seen, mm. they, they saw something in the, the show that they thought would be good. Um, mm. So just, just there, content. just quick, quickly, like you, earlier on, you, you had the um, online forum where you're tra- trading the CCTVs and stuff. You had that business. And then you have this business. Why, where are they now? Like, why, why did you move on from those? <laughs> so the football business, I got raided by the police. Okay, done. <laughs> <laughs> but the story of that is the, um, I had I'd already booked in. It's sort of like every time every, there's a chapter in my, every time there's a chapter closes in my life, the other one overlaps a little bit and just mm-hmm. opens. So my opening night of filth was two weeks after that happened or two weeks before. I can't remember. It's quite vague. But I was trying to get out of that anyway. It, it mm-hmm. was something that earned me money, but I didn't enjoy the, the cult. I'd grown out of it, basically. Yeah. And so I saw this new potential, which was something I'd always wanted to do. Because when I was 18, I wrote a business plan. I've got the business plan there. This came with all this stuff from my ex-girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And the night was called Greed. And it was a hard house night in Leeds. So I'd put this business plan together. I pitched it to the venue. I wrote it down. Everything visualized it. It was there, but it never it never happened. So fast forward, like five years later, um, I, it was happening, and I was like, "This is what I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to DJ to big crowds, yeah. and I can do that now through my own night." So I was quite excited. So it wasn't that big a deal. I lost that business yeah, yeah. because. And then what about the Inslows? <laughs> what? Where are they still going? Can you still hire them? No, I sold that business to James Malinder, um, my ex-sales manager. So he now runs it, and I have absolutely zero interest in it. Or gotcha, um, gotcha. So, so built. So did the build up a company, sell it on, move on to your next project. Yeah, so that's what I did. So the thing with Igloo Disco, it became a logistical nightmare. So once after Dragons Den, we quadrupled our turnover, like literally overnight. It was mm. ridiculous because we didn't get investment, but we got more than we would have got from investment from new business and it grew into something that I hated. It was like loads of staff, loads of vans, loads of weather. Do you know what I mean? All these factors mm. that you have to, and it's not, it doesn't suit my visionary style. I'm, I'm the visionary. And then I had to, I, I, I couldn't find the right people to run it. Mm. And yeah, it just turned into a monster that I didn't enjoy. Um, so, well, I guess, I guess on that tip then, you know, like you, you're sort of illustrating um, already how you have a, a bit of a natural knack for pivoting and adapting, which is important in the music industry. So um, bring it up to more recent events, you know, you had a successful platform built around helping DJs get bookings with um, the uh, Get Booked DJ Academy. Then COVID came along uh, and it has sadly destroyed the live scene, uh, which was also the focus of your business and thus its revenue. So I kind of want to talk about three, ask you three years around this. Um, one of them is how did you decide on your next business when this happened? What were the practical steps you took and how you managed to build it so quickly? So, yeah, so starting off with, uh, you know, how, talk us through how you decided to, to pivot into the new business. So with DJ Growth Lab was born from, um, I learned, I learned an online, I did an online course whilst I had Igloo Disco. And I, I, I always wanted to set up a second revenue stream for security reasons more than anything. So like when the events company had ups and downs seasons, um, so you can have, you can be, you have loads of cash flow one month and then you can drop off another. So I was slowly trying to figure out how to set up this new online business. And I wanted to t- teach, um, by doing the market research, I wanted to teach people how to run club nights, but then going deeper, deeper into that research, who's my ideal avatar. So you, your ideal avatar is your perfect audience. And um, it's like, who actually wants to launch a club night? So it's, it's DJs, 
uh, who want to get themselves out there. That's an ideal person, really. So I thought, okay, so if I want to get DJs to run club nights, they need to have fans. They need to have a following. So I, I started like blogging about how to get fans as a DJ. So I, that, it was a slow burner. I, I was like, I'm taking my time. I didn't need to set up another business. I was quite comfortable with the events company, but I wanted to do something. And so I was blogging for about a year and um, writing marketing blogs, how to get fans, um, social media tactics. They're still all on my website, dannysavage.com. It's quite old. I don't really update that site. Um, but that's how it all started, blogging. And I built up a, an email list of about 10,000 over a year just by that, not really spending any money on ads or it was all like organic. Um, what year was that round about? About four years ago. So 2007, 2016, 2017. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So off the back of that, um, I, set, um, I, I, I watched a webinar on, a, uh, on how to set up a Facebook group. So one Christmas, between Christmas and New Year, I decided to set this Facebook group up after watching a webinar on how to set up a Facebook group and use it to build a community. And I had all these emails so I just straight away, everyone invited them to this Facebook group and it grew to about 700 in a space of two weeks. So uh, I came up with a name, called it DJ Growth Lab. So we're all going to be about putting out um, information and sharing knowledge on how artists can grow. And then um, I realized that no one in the group had ever set goals. It was something that uh, like using goals. Uh, setting techniques that I use. I've just I'm doing a course at the moment uh, in our group on it. It's something that um, I've wrote a book on it, DJ Goals. So that was the book that we wrote. We, we wrote that book in three days. So I used all the stuff that I'd learned from business over the years, personal development, and wrote a book on how to set goals as an electronic artist and using a proven strategy. So that was the first book I'd ever wrote, and we sold it for forty pounds, I think. Mm-hmm. something like that and we managed to sell quite a few um and made, made a decent profit so that was the very first digital info product i'd ever made and sold and it was in profit straight away it was uh it was mm-hmm. really well but then people started getting results from it and people started using it and the group started growing and people started talking about the group inviting the friends saying look there's this group because what was missing in the electronic music industry was people teaching marketing and fan building and all that sort of stuff there's, there's production um you can learn production and all the technical stuff uh, all over, but no one was actually teaching and, and the life skills as well, personal development, uh, productivity, or, you know, goal setting, um, no, I'm time, mani- right. time management, that no one mm-hmm. teaches that sort of stuff. So I, I, I thought, yeah, that's what, um, that were our sort of thing. So fast forwarding over the years, since then it grew into now we have 10,000 free members, a 25,000 email database, active database. Um, and we've set up a separate company hosting villa retreats here in Ibiza, which was a goal I set years ago. And then we, and then we, we sold every single retreat out and that turned into a, a decent um, business. And last year we scheduled 24 back-to-back retreats. So we hired a villa, for a ridiculous amount of money, six figures um, for a year, 10 million pound villa with 10 bedrooms. And we put down deposits um, and everything. And we also had a membership site that we'd been running for about a year before that. And then COVID hit. So like with, with, with an online business, you, you need to have an ecosystem of different products and services for different wants and needs. So we have a free group, we have a podcast, which, are fr- which is free. And then we um, have a, an, an online membership, which is usually about 25 pound a month. And mm-hmm. then we have conferences and then we have high ticket stuff, which is the villa retreats, which are about 3,000 to 4,000 pound for a week VIP stay in a luxury villa with some of the best music producers and experts in the world. So we have all these different things all working together. Um, some people don't like learning online and they prefer flying to Ibiza for a week to immerse themselves. I'm that sort of person as well. I'd prefer to do that. And then some people just like learning online. And then, so it's, there's different budgets and different ways of learning. And that's what we provide all these different things. So one thing I was doing as well is I had an, I've got an iTunes number one podcast. I've interviewed, I'm interviewing you on it. Um, it's DJ Growth Lab podcast. 
and um, I really enjoy podcasting. So I was also building Abitha's first podcasting studio. So this, we had the retreats, we had the online membership, and then we were, I was building this podcasting studio. We're just taking over this building, uh, this this office space in San Cilalia with a sea view, with beautiful panoramic sea views, all the windows with like panoramic clear or mega. Uh, to do some artwork. We're still in there. And they said I can come and share the office for until they move uh, until they move out. So we were sort of like co-sharing this massive this massive open plan office with these guys mm-hmm. accountants. And um, so what had happened? I didn't actually sign any contracts. I was just in there for free. But what I was doing is I was getting the internet installed because as soon as they moved out, the internet were getting cut off, and I was like I needed it. So I was waiting for the internet to come be installed, and they would get packing their stuff to move out, and then. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, um, me and Adam we were sat in the office looking at this COVID thing unravel because it was a town centre. You could see the people and mm-hmm. like the less people every day and then people started wearing masks and and then there was queues outside the post office with social distancing and all this sort of weird stuff started. And you could, we were like literally watching it in slow motion over a week in, in the town centre. And then all of a sudden it just like lockdown hit. Um, so like yeah and we literally it was it was I'd, i i i i mean i'm in a community right called the um James the Franco's one <clears throat> no no i mean a few uh this one was it was daniel Priestley, the dent global community for key person of influence which was a really high ticket program that i went through um four years ago and we're in a we we we've got access to this group for life and Everyone in there uh, is a business owner who has gone through the same program and get support from Daniel Priestley, who's like a best-selling author. And someone was in there saying, um, this guy called Sebastian Bates, I've also been interviewed on his podcast about this, uh, about the law. He had um, loads of dojos and uh, physical buildings in Dubai and all over teaching uh, kids martial arts. Mm-hmm. And they, have, they literally got wiped out overnight, and they all, all got shut. And he said, "I had to have the I've, I had to have the difficult conversations with my staff." And it's like, "Look, you're going to have to work for a lot less than you're on now, and do a lot more work to keep this afloat. Otherwise, we're going to go bust." And so he said, "It was a difficult conversation." And he had it with all of his staff, and they said, "Look, if you really, if you still, because you, you're going to lose your job otherwise. If you need to pay the bills, you need, you're going to have to take a wage cut." And at the time, I had three t- full-time staff who were working on the retreats, um, sales, project management, and also uh, helping with the podcast studio. So overnight, all this went. The the retreats obviously came to a halt. We were, we were in the peak time of the year where the retreats were people were booking. We had loads of we, we we had bookings and we had loads of people in our CRM system ready to book. And we had Facebook ads running. We had thousands of pounds a week spent on Facebook ads. Um, so the the system was perfect. It, we were looking to do uh, three quarters of a million quid turnover that year for, just for the retreats on our first year as a as a as a new limited company. Um, so yeah, so the retreats came. So all the, all our staff, it was a case of like, I can pay you this, but you're gonna have to we're gonna have to find some different jobs for you because like obviously there's no one's gonna be buying retreats. Mm. The whole world's going into a lockdown. And also we're running a business called DJ Growth Lab and there's going to be no DJ gigs. So we're teaching DJs how to get gigs online. Mm. And we actually offered gigs and we had we had a residency at Ministry of Sound where we give our members gigs and all this and um it all was like we had to, Yeah. So we're like having to having to make these decisions and like I took the one of the key things from this is being part of a community of people like you is essential during stuff like this, especially. I've never realized it as much now, but just being in that community, the Daniel Priestley community and learning, it helped me do everything I've done since. So learning from people that are actually taking action quickly and how it worked out for them and them sharing their tactics and what they did. And I just straight away, I was like, right, I need to do that. And so I had that conversation. Um, all my team. Uh, agreed to be on a reduced monthly wage uh, and we found new roles within the business but then we also had this dj thing where djs were no longer going to be rel- relevant and i could i honestly said this 
I said, this is going to go on for over a year. I can mm. see this. This is going to be over in a few weeks. And I thought, DJing is going to be cancelled for a year. So what can we do now as a business to, because no one's going to want to learn how to DJ and get DJ bookings because there's going to be no DJ bookings. So we had to quickly come up with a new idea. And um, what are people going to be doing during lockdown? What valuable to everyone? Um, and we had some, some artists that we were working with called me up and said, look, how do we do this online teaching thing? We've lost all our DJ gigs. How can we earn some money online doing teaching like music production? So there's, there's some quite high profile artists as well uh, asked this. And I said, look, um, we might be able to help out. So we sort of like brainstormed and I came up with this idea of putting some of the best music producers in the world teaching production workshops every single day during lockdown. Um, so it was a live webinar. We, I'm, I've done hundreds of live webinars, you know, that you, yep. me and you talk webinars all the time. So I'm probably like the first person in the electronic music industry to start hosting loads of live webinars, teaching. And so all these artists were like out of work and needed something to do. Um, we needed, we had an audience that needed something to do. So we came up with this idea of like Netflix for producers and I put it in our group and this is a really good thing. If you've got a Facebook group or any sort of audience and you want to test out, I always test an idea out to my audience before I go ahead with it. It'll save you loads of time, effort and, and money if you do this. So create, before you create the product, create the demand for the product. So I put that in my group my DJ growth lab group I said Netflix for producers uh, who wants to join and 380 people said, where do I pay? And that were it. It was like, we made a really cool image. Actually it, it was cool, but it was like thrown together in two minutes and um, just had a Netflix logo, some a funny Adam put some sort of funny quote on it. I would literally put it out there and thought um, who wants this? And everyone wanted it. So like, right. Uh, we booked Rui de Silva for the first one in five days. So like, we, I, I'm really, I, I, I move quickly. I don't mess about ever. I'm well known for this. I'll, someone will, I'll, I'll pick up a tip and an idea and I'll take action on it like in, instantly mm -hmm. and I'll not sleep until it's done. So we built this, we built this brand new platform using our old uh, membership site. We just changed the URL and rebuilt loads of pages and um, put together a, a monthly subscription offer and um, we called it Mix Masters and the, the name, uh, I, I, I even put the name as a, uh, I put the name in the group for people to vote for the name. So it, it was built, we, we, not just for the community, but it was built by the community. They named it, they told us what they wanted, they told us the artists they wanted and we created what they wanted. So we, we provided that for, um, for them. Um, so yeah, Mix Masters was born. Uh, can't believe the name wasn't trademarked because it's, um, it's quite popular. It does seem like an obvious name. And that you, so, it's, it's, so I think it were a popular 80s documentary, like a show, TV show or something, wasn't it? Yeah, it does, it does ring a bell. And then what, what, how did you, so the content, obviously you've got to create content for monthly members. How, how did you approach that? So like the, the USP at the time of Mix Masters when we launched, this was like March 2020. So we're literally a couple of weeks into lockdown. I don't even know if UK had gone into lockdown when we launched it. I think it might be in the first week of UK because we were in lockdown three weeks before in Spain. Um, so what we did, the USP was a live production workshop every single day. So we like everyone who was working on the retreats had to now manage a project that was hosting live webinars every day. So we had to be, we're in contact with high profile artists. We had Rui de Silva for the first one. Um, and we've had, we had Roger Sanchez in the first few days. So it was utilizing all the contacts we've made all the, over the years of running club nights and everything I've done. It was reaching out to all my networks, calling some favors in. Um, for some people, it was me doing them a favor as well because the, it was extra cash. So it was a win-win for everyone. We were creating a, a, a valuable content every day. It was giving our audience, it was a lockdown, something to focus on every single day. So every day they were tuning in live. The, 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 the show up rate for the lives were ridiculous during that first few months um, because no one had 
anything else to do. It was the first mm. time they'd ever been locked in a house in their life. And um, so we were providing this amazing content where you could access some of the best producers in the world of electronic, electronic music every day. You could speak to them, ask questions. They taught their tactics. Um, so we did a hundred and we did about 120 days live nonstop every wow. day. We had a couple of cancellations and um, it, looking back now, the amount of stress we used to go through if something wrong went, went like if, <laughs> if someone canceled or we're nearly going to cancel or we had a tech problem just for one day, we're like, no, we have to do it every single day. This is what we're about. It's every day. We can't let this happen. We need to get someone else. And looking back now, it's like, fucking hell, should just have a day off? <laughs> it was intense, man. And uh, so like having to schedule these in, having someone hosting them, um, then afterwards, um, uploading it to the website for people that have missed it. And, um, but yeah, but then after lockdown, so we, after lockdown had finished, obviously quite a few we, we, numbers started dropping. So we peaked at about 450 members and then we went down to about 300. And um, it was like, right, we took a bit of a breather. I thought, well, we've got 120 courses now so we already had a lot of courses from previous we've got marketing courses we've got mm. personal development courses networking courses all this stuff we've created over the years but we didn't really focus that much on music production because i'm not a music producer i, I run a music production business now and I'm, i don't produce so that's another good one <laughs> but i thought we've got about 120 courses and um this is gold and it's like um what we've not done is had the time or resources to edit them all afterwards we just chop the beginning and the end off usually the waffle like mm. or chatting on zoom before so i then started um i found a, 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 i've created a full-time team now we've got five full-time team members i created a full-time team of uh content editors so what we've done is every single course we've ever done is we've gone and edited out the um all the fluff we've turned it into chapters uh, so for every course that it's broken into chunks instead of one two hour long webinar, it's sectioned off. Um, we've had it transcribed and we've had keywords put in there. Uh, this has been a big job. It's been going on for nearly five, five months now. We've still not really, um, we've, we've not released the front end yet. So we've got all in all 180 courses that have been edited, transcribed and, um, polished and keyword optimized and everything's there ready to now start building that front end. So we're going to, we're going to use that content for, uh, we're going to have a, like a, if you've ever been on skillshare.com, we're just copying their model. It's a um, free preview video. So you can come on our website and view a trailer and a, and a small section of every single course for free. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, if you, if you like some of the courses, you can have a one pound trial and, um, 14 day one pound trial and that's what's that that's available now on the website mixmasters.net but the preview bit isn't yet ready mm -hmm. to launch so that's what we're building now so we've spent five months editing and creating all the content and the courses and then we're now going to start populating the front end of the website and gotcha um, so essentially you've then, taken a uh you've taken like a two-hour live webinar and then formalized that into chapters, what you'd normally get if you went on to like Udemy or something like that, where it's broken up and it's, and people have got, I guess, a, a, a path to follow an A to B path. Yeah, that's right. It's like the people's people learn. Um, there's a really good course called learning how to learn. I think it is. I can't remember the woman. She's like the, she's, um, she's like a mathematician and um, she teaches the best strategies on learning online and breaking it down into chunks, digestible chunks with a little takeaway after each chunk um, is the best way to deliver an online course. So, and then also you can, you can, you can, you, you can make that searchable. So you don't have to sit and look through a two hour webinar just to find a little one minute tip on Facebook ads. You can type in the keyword and it'll take you to that one little section where it's only three, four or five minutes long. So it, it's um but yeah so it's, gotcha. it's it's turning all that it's like we were sat and we've 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 already done we've done loads and loads of webinars over the years so we already had a lot of content already um in the membership we already had about 
a hundred courses. We've actually removed a lot of them now, which are redundant uh, because the quality of our stuff's high, uh, gone a, a lot higher. Um, we're yeah, and then there's a lot of like obviously with with social media and marketing, you need to be constantly on the pulses. There were loads of stuff in there that was out of date, so we removed a lot of content, and now we're redoing a lot of content. We're creating more courses. So what Mix Masters is now is a mix mixture of live webinars every week so we don't do them every day we stop doing every day we gradually we gradually weaned them off it because it <laughs> were like okay we need to stop doing this daily thing because it's killing us um let's do four four a week and then we went down to three a week then two a week and now we do one a week guaranteed but um sometimes two depending on what we're doing so we, we focus we have different challenges so when we like we'll do a four week challenge, a marketing challenge build with just the one called build 1000 true fans funnel. Mm-hmm. So it's building marketing funnels for artists. And then running parallel with that, we did a remix competition with Huxley. Um, so there's something for everyone. So it's like catering for beginner producers, experienced producers, um, people that want to just spend the time on marketing as, instead of production. There might be really good quality producers already and they don't really need to learn much more. Mm-hmm. But they need to brush up on the marketing. Um, and then also we, we do remix competitions where our members get signed to labels, big labels, and get um, mm. themselves in front of big artists. So we've got like a whole ecosystem of different things going on. But I think the main thing is the community as well. The the community is the, like the backbone of everything. The Facebook group, um, collaborations are going off. People are making friends. I, I saw two guys this week. Take a, they were, one of them went to the other guy's house and the, did this. You there? You, you just Sorry. You stopped. Sorry, you stopped for a second. Um, so you've, you've built this big ecosystem. How, and, and I know, and I understand that it's, it's having the community there already is, <laughs> is a great way to launch it. But talk us through how you are currently or how you aim to market this and grow the audience, grow your, grow your uh, customer audience for it? Um, so we're, we're at the moment, we're not, we're not pushing memberships. So we go through a phase of, so we, last year we did a summit, an online summit. You spoke at the summit. Um, it was amazing. Mm. It was hard work, but off the back of that, we managed to get a hundred new members uh, into, uh, into Mixed Masters. And then we did a Black Friday deal where we got another 100 new members. And since then, we've not done anything. So what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm learning from what the members like and don't like, um, making tweaks, changing it, getting feedback. And then we're ready to, we're going to start pushing it out again in the next few weeks. And what kind of things we, are you going to use to push it out? Like, pre- um, like practical things. Are you using Facebook ads, are you using Google ads? Like, yeah. yeah. So I've got a big email list, which is good to launch something, but also Facebook ads. And um, I don't, one thing with us is we don't really, we're not that good on social media. We're not, we don't, we're not, like, I think for me. You're not content providers on social media where you're doing we, loads of we stuff. We do a bit. Show. We go through ups and downs, but you just don't see that return anymore. Instagram is atrocious. Um, Facebook's not, you don't, it's not even worth posting on your Facebook page um you're you're referring to organic posting as well aren't you yeah organic or any sort of organic it's just it's not we don't get the return and like we could do but it's obviously it's the long game and i'm really impatient and um i I, i'm really good at facebook ads and i spend all our budget on facebook ads and i know that they'll get me a return and our cost per acquisition has gone down loads recently due to like testing different campaigns like free trials versus one pound trials versus 14 day trials versus 30 day trials. So I've been testing a lot of that stuff out and I think we've sort of like found the sweet spot. Which, which actually, so talking through those, cause it's really interesting. What, what actually have you found works really well? Is it a free or one pound? Um, yeah. Out of those, out of those one four pound. categories. Yeah. What the one pound one is um, we, yeah, the one pound trial is work, it works better because I think you get a lot the per, for someone to get their card out and pay a pound. It's only a pound, but it's that 
it's the time and effort that goes into it. Whereas in just putting your email address in and signing up for something, it's like anyone, you can, it takes a second and you just click a button and then you never log in and it's just a waste of everyone's time. Um, so it's. What made you pick a pound? What made you pick a pound though? Trial, actually. What made you pick a pound instead of doing Adam? a, what made you pick a pound instead of say doing a like 14 or five pound or, you know, why so low? It's it's more or less a free trial, but, but you're having to commit to getting your de- card details and put the card details in, which is like it's a mini, it's a micro commitment, and then it you, and it's just testing, I suppose. Like everything I do, it's test, 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 and the membership's only twenty five quid anyway. So I really want people to see the value in it, and I, and it's now at a level where you get into the library and it's really well arranged. We've got we've, we've had custom coded features put in there, so it's really easy to navigate. So you can search keywords. So driving people into that to see so they can get a taste of it. But we like I said, the, one of the admin nightmares of having a free trial is putting people into the Facebook group and then having to remove them because you can't automate that, which is a pain in the ass as well so if we're getting 20 people a day into the facebook group they're having to remove them in 7 14 days it's just like constant and then people sign into the facebook group with different names and all that it's just there's quite a few other things as well it's just an admin uh thing Mm. more than anything but it's the data doesn't lie the data doesn't lie and the the conversion rates from free trials um into the membership uh were about 30 percent, and then um the last one pound trial was 68%. So 68% of the people that signed up on a one pound trial stayed. So, and how does that, how does that, the value, how does that practically work at the end of the 14 days? Is it a thing where they're signing? It'll automatically switch over to the 25 pounds a month, or do you send an email saying, um, Hey, we're going to do this. Do you want to cancel it? Like what's the psychology and how do you kind of approach that? Yeah, it's in the terms when they sign up. But um, it's twenty. They're signing up for twenty five pound a month with a with a one pound trial, and it, it states that after that uh, after that period, it was thirty days. The last one we did. So after that thirty day period, um, you'll be billed twenty five pounds per month. Um, but you can cancel at any time, no obligation. It's in your it's in your dashboard. Quite easy. Just go on the site into your profile and change your details or cancel your membership. Um, so one thing I'll, I will say, right, is the, the people that cancel, you know, I've never heard of them. I, it's like I, I've got my membership wired up to Slack, so a pop-up saying this name has cancelled um, X membership. We have different types of membership. And it's always someone I've never heard of, and that means that they've not joined the Facebook community and they're not active in the Facebook community because I've never heard the name ever. And there's a lot of people like this. So what, what the, the key to keeping members, I think, is making sure that they're active in the community and get involved in the community. So because um, the com- people join for the content, they'll stay for the community, yeah? It's a good, <laughs> it's a I, I was waiting quote. for that quote. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good quote that people use in the, in the online space, but it's true. It's like you build the community and not necessarily, I, I know some of the data in the back end that most of the people uh, are in this. Well, so a lot of people in the community um, haven't access to course for over a month, for example, you know, so they're not using the membership site as much, but they're using the, 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 the community for feedback and the collaborating and they're doing the live challenges. Uh, they're not necessarily going in and watching the pre-recorded stuff, but then there's other people that there's a guy called Jimmy McGee, He's done every single course we've got. I swear to God, every single course. I'm like, he just sits there all day in his spare time doing all the courses and he leaves a comment under every course and lets us know what he thinks of it. And he's not as active in the group and he doesn't, um, I've I've only seen him on like one or two live webinars, but he's in the USA, for example. So, but yeah, he's he's like different people take different things from it. Um, but the remix competitions as well, a lot of people love them because they've, it's a career defining moment, getting signed to a label and having the track released on a big label on, on the same uh, EP as a big artist. We've just chosen four, three winners from our uh, group who are signed on the new Mix Masters label it's, and Huxley's on there. So if you don't know, Huxley is like a big house DJ mm. producer uh, who's just had a, who's just been signed to ultra exclusively so 
he's going to be on our next on, on our very first mix masters um ep which is raising funds for the samburu tribe in kenya so that's pretty cool so that we do little cool projects like that and it, that can be that, that can be a life-changing thing for some of these artists it, 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 well it is um some other guys have been signed on another uh, ep with satek a techno ep on satek's label um it's, it's lots wicked. of collaborations in the community yeah so I want to um, I'm not, I'm going to move on to selling trends in the music industry because I've I've got a sort of series of questions that I ask every guest to get some feedback on. Um, so I'm I'll, I mean I'll just jump in. So some of these are a bit more relative for people who are who are are an artist or they're uh, running a label or they're a manager managing artists, which I know is slightly out for you, but I think you still have some great insight. Um, what have you? What's your experience that you find with the artists you're working with? Have they said where they're finding their music royalties are coming from are they, are they from spotify itunes what sort of feedback have you been getting so my this is it's a in the electronic music world as you know all well it's more i'd say more so in house and techno beat ports like the the, the beat port chart position is a lot more relevant as a goal for them than the money um there's very little money um to be made from selling tracks on Beatport. Um, but that's where they focus all their attention is Beatport. I don't think there's enough um, people are, especially in our community, there's not as much focus on Spotify mm. as there is on Beatport still because the, the, the chart positions work, like I said, the chart positions is the goal. And that's what people want to get. Like I'd love to be able to teach people how to release independently. And I do encourage people to set up their own, their own label as well. Um, but I think like it's a really weird one. I, I, I say this quite often, but in, a, in any industry in the world, you can teach someone to sell their own thing and make their own money. So like, I can, I can teach someone a strategy on an online course. I can put it together tonight and launch it tomorrow. And I'm guaranteed to make a couple of grand in my own pocket because I know how to teach that thing. Um, but like an electronic musician, it's you can't teach them a, it's really difficult to teach them a quick win to earn quick money like that unless mm. they release independently i suppose and but then they won't do that because it's like they, they want to get on beatport and they mm. want to get that rec recognition because like it's it, it gives you the dj gigs as well so it builds your authority builds your credibility build, uh, it aligns you with good labels and it that's how you get gigs so dj gigs is uh, like a byproduct of getting a beat pot chart position as well um so there's a culture there's a culture of wanting to be signed to existing record labels to sort of straight away like, like either get you a beat pot top 10 or number one and as a it's like i guess a nod to say hey you've, you've kind of you're, you're successful because you've managed to sign to one of these labels yeah it's like it can it can be the make or break for you that if you get signed to one of these big labels. Yeah, um, I I do I do actually I do agree with that. Um, but what what I do find is how do you get signed to that label is often putting your music out there first, showing you've got an audience. You know, to, and yeah. to show you've got an audience, you've got to have it out on a platform on <clears> your own music, and then off the back of that, try and get signed to a, a try and get signed to a label, and then there are artists that are releasing on their own labels and then releasing on Ultra as well. So. I think that there is there is still room for both of them, I guess, and you want to you want to have both those targets. Um, moving on to, I know Spotify isn't the most important thing, um, but you know, outside electronic music, it is still getting on Spotify playlists. Uh, have, is there anything you've found that works really well for if artists are looking to get on Spotify playlists? Um, that's something I I, I I I stay away from Spotify. I'll I leave that to the experts. We've got various people come into our community. So one, one of the key things about mix masters is we bring in experts for each area. So we have courses by you. We've had like, um, we've had a little mini course on setting up a label in seven steps. Um, we have John gold coming and done some Spotify stuff and, um, on download gates as well He's the owner of hyped it. We've had Graham farmer coming previously. Um, so I, I don't tend to spend much time on Spotify. So my strengths mm -hmm. are, uh, Facebook ads, communities, online memberships, um, and sales funnels, marketing funnels, all that sort of stuff. Um, helping people build um, fans through download gates is something that we uh, we've 
had some good results on recently. We've done a whole six, it was a six week challenge building a funnel, um, uh, a free download funnel, giving away free music. One thing I will say to artists for building fans is um, get used to giving away free tracks in return for an email address. Um, now, and- can, I, can I talk about that as well? Because we are m- like, I guess, and I have an answer for this, but I'd like to hear your answer. And that when we're moving into a world of streaming and people don't own music, how are you going to get someone to give an email address to download an MP3 when people are like, well, I've just got my Spotify playlists. Like, I don't want to download something. How are you overcoming that? Bootlegs. So one thing I tell people to produce is bootlegs. Like, so bootlegs, if you don't know what bootleg is, it's, um, it's an unofficial remix of a track. So the bootleg strategy, one guy in our group this week is just that his bootleg is being played by Nervo um, off the back of what we've just done. And he's put it together. He's never made a bootleg. He did a London grammar bootleg. It's getting radio players. Nervo have played it. Right, so this is a strategy with a bootleg. Find something that your ideal audience love. Nostalgia is the key. Yeah. So the first time I did this with an artist, I, I helped him get a Beatport top twenty in the in the trance charts. Yeah. It's easier than techno and house in the trance charts, but he got a top twenty thing because he released three bootlegs. So Paul Van Dyke for an Angel was one of them, or boot or Beach Ball. I can't remember which one. Oxia Domino, maybe another, I can't remember, but they're all like big nostalgic tracks where people are like, oh, I fucking remember this. But if you can update that and put your own updated twist on it and make it relevant, DJs want it. Yes, DJs will want to play that because no one else has got it. You're never going to get it signed because it's, it won't get cleared, so you can only give it away anyway. So you can give this track away. You, you're, not, you're not losing any money, and you're getting yourself out there. So what you want to be doing is building an exclusive list of other DJs that want exclusive bootlegs from you. And then you can slowly introduce them to your other tracks as well. You know what I mean? So you're getting them, you're getting them in sale. You could call it like your VIP um, track list. It's just for DJs. For example, you sign up for this list, you get all my exclusive freebies um, before anyone else, but then you're building up like uh, the, the the law of reciprocity, like is it like Cialdini, a good book if you want to read it about this. It's called Influence by Robert Cialdini. I think mm-hmm. you might have read it. I don't know, but the law of reciprocity is like giving free value away, giving freebies, freebies. For example, if you've you've all been past like a shop, or I got done in Seville a bit ago, right? Um, a woman came up and she she was giving away like. Free, I think it was free cheese or something like, mm-hmm. and then she, the next thing you go to the shop and she goes, oh yeah, and then you'll have a look and then you feel obliged to buy some of a 25 euro cheese. It's like really <laughs> high end. And it's because you've had that free gift that uh, if you, you, and like, I even knew when I walked away, I guess I've been done. She did me. <laughs> she like, and I, I knew it and it was funny. I laughed and like, that is the, the psychology. There's loads of, is Chaldean is like literally spent decades researching this and doing tests and all, there's all sorts of uh, different cases in there explain it, but giving away free value, demonstrating free value, giving away free gifts to your audience, making them feel uh, exclusive and giving them something that they want, which, um, and then when you do have something to sell, which is only a one pound 50 beat part track, when it comes to selling it, it's like you more, the more, inclined to support you and say thank you for giving me all the free stuff um in the past and so do, do so, you think yeah. that could be do you think there could be a used let's say if you weren't in electronic music uh, if you're uh, making more traditional music or or an indie band or something the equivalent would be doing a cover track of a nostalgic track and then giving that away or having that on like a private you know an, a, a, a a private youtube channel that people can only access by yeah. giving away an email address I'll give you a really good example. Uh, have you ever heard of Walk Off the Earth? A band no. called Walk Off the Earth. They're absolutely phenomenal. I don't know if they're still together. Um, I need, I'm going to check them out actually today. But back in my, um, back in pre kids, when I, I actually had time to listen to new music and stuff, um, there's, there's a cover band called Walk Off the Earth, and they, they do like instrumental covers of loads of big tracks. They did one of that Gotye, um 
Left to cut me off. Yeah. Um, somebody that she used to know, I can't remember the name. Of it, they did, know, they did an the... instrumental cover of that in the apartment in San Francisco, using pots and pans and loads of mad stuff. But and then the the, the vocalist, she was she absolutely phenomenal. And all they did were like really cool covers, and they absolutely blew up. And then the, the tour in the world selling out everywhere. We couldn't get tickets to see them in Leeds uh, or Manchester. We couldn't. You couldn't get tickets for shit. It was impossible. And they they built the whole brand on putting together covers on YouTube. So yeah, hundred percent, you can do that. Um, so go, so moving on to um, kind of final questions around the um, uh, around selling trends. Um, I, you are an um, uh, expert with the um, paid advertising. Um, so in particular, for any artists or labels that are listening. What right now is working in 2021 for you with paid advertising? Like where should we where should we be focusing our advertising spend? Um, okay, so Facebook and Instagram is what I always use. Um, there's it's difficult at the moment. I've took a break from Facebook ads because um, there's a few new things come in. They've they've removed the the optimization window. Um, seven day click one day view or something that uh, they've, they've changed that. But then also the iPhone, the iOS updates coming in, I think in June, this is going to be like a gold rush um, leading up to June. So the, there's, there's a big thing online with Facebook have fallen out with Apple massively over this, they're, they're mm. literally calling them out and stuff. And uh, it's funny, two of the biggest tech giants in the world falling out, but iOS, the new iOS updates coming out is going to, it's going to give you people the opportunity to block all tracking pixels. And uh, so Facebook retargeting is going to be wiped out uh, unless you opt in. Mm. So retargeting is one of the main things with Facebook ads and Instagram ads. Um, so if you're not familiar with Facebook and Instagram ads, you have, you, you get what you call a tracking pixel, which is you, when you set up your ads account and you put that in your website and um, it will, track people, anyone that comes on your website, you can then retarget them with ads basically on the Facebook or Instagram ads platform. Most of the conversion rates come through um, retargeting. A lot of people will visit your website once, they'll have a look and think, oh, I'll go back to that. And then you send the, the t- retargeting will remind them to go back again. And that's, that's one of the best strategies um, for acquiring new members. So that's going to be wiped out in June. So um, there's quite a lot of big changes on the Facebook and Instagram ads platform at the moment. So I'm sort of like hanging fire and, uh, and I've just invested in a brand new course. Um, it's like high end course and I'm doing that at the moment. And it's all about all the new changes. It's like literally up to date. The new course was filmed this year and re- released a few weeks ago. So I'm going to hang fire until I've finished that course to set my new campaign up. But in general, um, so what I'd, I'd advise doing a bit of research on all the new policies coming in and making sure that uh, you're up to date with Facebook ads. If you are going to run Facebook ads, always learn, uh, always update your learning every month. Always keep checking out new courses. Um, it's something that changes very quickly. Um, so always keep updating your knowledge on Facebook ads, keep testing stuff and um, always have something running if you can, yeah, even at a low budget just running in the background. Um, but I guess what, yeah, what, what's a, I get, maybe, maybe there's a, a question around this. What are some rookie mistakes or common problems that you see over and over with paid advertising? Um, always people clicking boost post. Um, it's, you really need to get into Facebook ads manager, set up a Facebook ads business account and get up a, a Facebook ads manager account and get familiar with that and don't just click boost post because you're literally pissing in the wind. It's just like Facebook make that feature in my opinion, just to get cash out of people that don't know what they're doing. So spend some time and learn how to use business manager, how to set ads up properly in the campaign um, window, learn the different stages. There's three stages to ads. There's a campaign level, ad set and ad. They're the three things you need to learn. Um, Targeting used to be something that you really needed to be really good at, but now there's a thing called campaign budget optimization that more or less does the work for you. So you can be quite broad and general where you're targeting. Um, but 
focus 80% of your attention on creative, which is the ad itself. So get good at writing sales copy, get good at writing captivating headlines, get good at hooks, which is like makes people want to read the rest of the description, make the, the rest of the copy. And also the image or the video get really good at um, making sure that they pop out. So imagine you're scrolling and you want it to pop out the screen and make someone stop and well, oh, what's that? So that 80% of Facebook ads is the creative. That's what you should focus on. So let's say, for example, a musician wants to put out a teaser for a free track. They really want to be focused on, a, on like a little small video, maybe 15, 20 seconds long with the with the the hook of the track, which would probably be the breakdown or the, the vocal or the drop, something that like makes people want to listen to more. So creating that little 15, 20 second video with that bit, but then putting some cool videos behind it, like um, people dancing. some sort of graphic animation. One thing we found really well with the trans funnel that we built with the, the guy who got on Beatport Top 20, it, we, we, we took like little video clips of tomorrow and stuff like that with loads of pyrotechnics and loads of like festival fire and lights and all that. Straight away, it pops out to that ideal. What, what's going to pop out to your ideal audience? And if your ideal audience is trans lovers, they're going to love seeing like loads of fire and pyrotechnics. And, mm. and so that worked really well. So put in like little demos of your free track and then click through to a hyped it download gate. Um, and then asking for an email address and a SoundCloud follow in return for the free download. That's how we, that's the best results we've found with our. Facebook ads funnels. Gotcha. So it's been amazing having you on the show, Danny, and uh, hearing about the stories at the beginning and how you learned to get, uh, you know, all your experiences and what you learned along the way. Um, looking to the future, what are you most excited about in the future of the music or music marketing? Either club's opening. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I guess that's true, isn't it? Just having, being able to go out and see live music again and DJs. Yeah, I think um, just, yeah, social interaction. And uh, we, we, we love putting on live events, our retreats and our uh, conferences. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's one thing I do miss. I like, it's all, we thrived through this lockdown and COVID era online, but um uh, like the physical events is something that I really miss. I do miss flying to London and meeting people and, mm. uh, and all that. But, um, so, um, Mark, I'm just trying to think of any marketing trends I'm looking forward to. Clubhouse. Ah, that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk clubhouse. Um, right. So I've done a free guide as well on this. So if you want to get this free guide, it's mixmasters.net forward slash clubhouse. But I was introduced to clubhouse a few weeks ago and it's an invite only platform. So you have to know someone who's on it to get an invite. It's quite easy if you're good at hustling, but um, mm. if you're not, it'll probably drag on for a month. Um, and it's only available on iOS at the moment. So clubhouse is like a platform for engaging conversation. So it's like dropping audio. You can drop into rooms where people are discussing certain topics. Like we've hosted a few with Nick um, and on music marketing, we've done some on production. We did a, we had a mastermind session last Friday night where we had Lenny Fontana and Brandon Block and Creature and some other Huxley. It was just like all oh, chatting career advice and discussions on marketing and all sorts of stuff. Um, but yeah, Clubhouse is amazing. And it's, it's really, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's at the perfect time. It could have been more perfect last summer when, when the first lockdown hit. But during this time now where people are missing social interaction and missing uh, meeting new people and speaking to people, um, it's a really, really good platform to get involved. Um, and I love it. Get involved. You're like, it's literally, you can drop in rooms with some of the biggest tech billionaires in the world. Like we had Elon Musk in a room a few days ago. Um, like where, where can you get that sort of access? You get, it's like free masterminds with the best people in the industry di discussing tactics, uh, routines, habits, marketing strategies, business strategies, life strategies, parenting strategies. You, there's all sorts of stuff in there and it's all free and you can drop in, you can ask questions, you can listen to people sharing advice. 
and we host our own rooms as well. Uh, and you can you can even host um, you can even do your own music rooms. Um, so there's like label feedback rooms. There's people singing, pitching their songs or ideas. Yeah, I've been on a couple of those. Yeah, yeah, Clubhouse is it's amazing. I love it. Um, I've, it's addictive though. So schedule time to be on it. Yeah. And on it all day. I've had be to careful with the notifications. notifications. I've turned them off completely now, yeah. um, but I have I, I do schedule talks on there every week, and uh, yeah, it's enjoyable. So I think that's a really big one for networking. Some of our members have hosted rooms on there, and they've all like met loads of new people and they've formed new collaborations and friendships. So yeah, Clubhouse is a really good thing to get on. It's new. It's like any social media. If you get on it quick when it first starts and build a following, you can. Like you'll monetize it well later. Like look at Instagram influencers when they first got on there and started absolutely hammering it. And then now they've got millions of followers. Mm. So if you can utilize the platform to your advantage and um, I'd get on there quick and get involved. Get on Clubhouse. Uh, Danny, thank you again for your time. That was the longest and most epic uh, series episode that we've done. Um, Yes, uh, please go to, to find out more. If you want to sign up, go to Mixmasters, M-I-X-M-A-S-T-E-R-S dot net, N-E-T. Uh, download, you can download that, uh, the Clubhouse um, guide and lots of other useful material around how to build a successful career in electronic music. And a sign off. Thank you again, Danny. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, everyone, for listening. 